This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. I've traveled a lot during my life. Admittingly, it's most of it's only been by car. I'm not a jet setter by any means, and I've really only gone as far west as Texas. And that was when I was a little kid, so I really don't have much memory of it. But the East Coast? On the East Coast, I've been everywhere. I've made that interstate my bitch. I-95? No. I call it my 95. So by proxy, I've stayed in more hotels than I can count. Some a lot better than others. The tales of haunted hotels in this country are abundant. There is, at very least, one in every state. The most famous is probably the Stanley Hotel out in Colorado. I don't want to jump too much into that one, mainly because a Colorado episode is coming up, and perhaps the Stanley might come up in that one. There is a solid chance. I will say that it did serve for the inspiration of the classic Stephen King novel, The Shining. So you can only imagine the stories that come from that place. A haunted hotel in Arkansas, you say? Let's get it. I've only had one kind of experience with the unexplained in a hotel. I won't say paranormal because I'm not sure it wasn't partly a dream. So I'm sticking with the unexplained. Yeah, that sounds better. I was passing through North Carolina, driving home from Florida, and stopped over for a night that I think it was a Red Roof Inn, not far off the interstate. I wasn't with anyone, and I'm not picky. Hell, I'd have slept in my car if I was close enough to a rest area. But it was still 30 minutes from me, and I was having a severe case of the head nods. It was pretty late when I got to my room, and my plan was only to sleep for five or six hours and get home. I had about nine more hours ahead of me, and I was in a rush. I nodded off pretty quickly, but the feeling of being slapped in the face woke me up out of my partial doze. I shot up, but I was, of course, alone in the room. I got up to head to the bathroom and to check behind the shower curtain. When I made my way around to the foot of the bed, that's when I noticed two shadows under the door leading to the hallway, as if someone was standing in front of the door. I froze for a moment before I walked to the door to peek out through the peephole, and of course there was no one there. When I backed up to look down, the shadows were gone too. I opened the door and popped my head out into the hallway, and of course, it was empty. A little freaked out, I climbed back into the bed, and shortly after, exhaustion took me. The morning came, and I quickly left the room and headed home. But now, you can guarantee that when I stay at a hotel, for my own peace of mind, I always lay a towel in front of the door. Many stories of hauntings surround the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. As one of the area's oldest and most notorious hotels, many generations have passed through its doors, and some may have never left. For years, guests have reported strange noises and sightings of unexplained phenomena in and around the hotel. From mysterious lights flickering in the night to unexplained voices, We'll see why this place has become so legendary with supernatural enthusiasts and try to figure out why its ghostly inhabitants still linger today. Do you believe in ghosts? Join me on a journey through America's dark and haunted past as we explore ghost stories and folklore that have been passed down for generations. What scares you? Let's find out. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. If you were interested to check out Arkansas Paranormal and you did a Google search, the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs will surely come up. The 72-room resort 
has a reputation as arguably the most haunted place in the state. The hotel was completed in 1886 at a tremendous cost of nearly $300,000, incredible for the time, and billed itself as the most opulent in America, perched high above the city and surrounded by the Ozark Mountain Forests. It catered to wealthy guests partaking locally of what was advertised as healing waters. It didn't take long to realize that the water was not therapeutic, and guests soon disappeared. The Crescent has seen many changes over the years, from a woman's college to a cancer hospital run by an evil fraudster offering miraculous cures that turned out to be bogus. Various investors have tried and failed to restore the grand building to its former glory, leaving it empty and contributing to its spooky reputation. However, in 1997 began a decade-long journey that eventually resulted in bringing back the hotel to as we see it now, an ever-popular destination. The Crescent welcomes the ghosts of its past with open arms. Most luxury properties of that magnitude may want to try and distance themselves from them, but not the Crescent. The hotel's ghost tours include viewing its former morgue and autopsy room, they host special events to scare up a good time, and they have photos to show ghosts of all shapes and sizes, which can be found on their website. Look for Michael if you visit the hotel. He was a stone cutter who helped build the hotel and fell to his death in room 218. Dr. John Fremont Ellis, a former hotel physician, is another ghostly guest. The man has been reported to have been seen wearing a top hat and fine clothing on the staircase from the second floor to the lobby and smoke from his pipe can sometimes be smelled near the elevator. Most who visit the Crescent have wonderful things to say and often say they will return time and time again. But some guests may have had some different experiences. Touched by a Ghost, a spine-tingling true story of the Crescent Hotel, available on OnlyInArc.com, written by author Adria English, talks about a guest's harrowing experience in the Crescent Hotel. I never want to stay at the Crescent Hotel again, Summerlin's scoff begins. It was awful. Awful. It had been Summerlin's notion to remain at the Crescent Hotel for Valentine's Day with Carl, her then-husband, and their friends Alice and Ted. Alice was apprehensive about staying in an allegedly haunted hotel. Alice was terrified, she kept saying. It's haunted, but I just said, no it isn't. Ghosts aren't real. Summerlin persisted until Alice and Ted finally agreed. Strangely enough, it was Summer Lynn who felt odd within the hotel walls. She became lightheaded and nauseous as soon as she stepped inside. She reasoned that it must have been a pregnancy-related issue. Still, she hadn't sensed any nausea before entering the building. I was like, why am I so sick? I got nauseated as soon as I went in that building. She became increasingly nauseated during the ghost tour. Upon arriving at room 218, known as Michael's room, she became lightheaded to the point where she passed out. As the tour guide asked, is she okay? Her husband responded, yeah, she's just pregnant. The tour guide replied, well, you're more sensitive to it when you're pregnant. Despite Summerlin's skepticism about ghosts, she was sensitive to the presence of one of the Crescent Hotel's regulars. Like I touched on earlier, Michael, who was a stonemason, was said to have fell in room 218 and died. His ghost is thought to touch, tap, and otherwise just affect female visitors. Hmm, another creep ghost like George from Tombstone. Summer Lynn, her husband, and friends headed to downtown Eureka Springs after the tour. Once Summer Lynn left the hotel, she felt fine again. She thought nothing of it until, when she returned to the hotel, her sickness came with her. As a result, the group canceled their plans for the evening so that she could rest. Summer Lynn was laying in bed dozing off as Ted frequently walked back and forth to the bathroom as the two couple shared a room with beds across from each other. It's some Valentine's Day, huh? Though he seemed a bit sick, she wondered what he was doing. She felt as if someone grabbed her toes as soon as she fell asleep again, and she jerked awake. She thought it was Ted trying to scare her. However, she couldn't see him anywhere. She searched the dark room, straining her eyes to see and she just drifted back to sleep, wondering what was going on. A man suddenly then cleared his throat next to her. <clears throat> it was so close, his mouth must have been just a few inches from her ear, she said. She was on the opposite side of the bed from where her husband was sleeping. After hearing the man's disembodied voice right next to her ear, Summer Lynn could only hear her heart pounding nervously for the rest of the night. 
Summerlin inquired about Ted's nighttime stroll when the others were in the room awake early in the next morning. Since she had seen him walking around and going to the bathroom, she believed that he had been the one to tweak her toes and cleared his throat next to her ear before retreating to his bed. Ted looked at her strangely and said, I never went to the bathroom. I never left my bed. Summerlin was slammed with the idea of a strange man, an apparition perhaps, walking around their room at night and touching her. We're leaving, she announced. They checked out at around 8 a.m., before checkout time, and without waiting for breakfast. They left the Crescent Hotel, but the haunting experience of nearly 15 years ago remains. Summerlin's experience is far from unique. The Crescent Hotel is renowned for its supernatural activity, occurring throughout the building and on different times of day. Bill Ott, who is the director of marketing for the hotel, claims that there is no malicious intent behind the hauntings. He explains that the ghosts may continue to frequent their favorite spots in life due to unfulfilled business or simply because they enjoyed it when they were alive. His summation is that the Crescent Hotel has been making people happy since 1886. So a few of them just keep coming back for more. Hey folks, I want to pause for a minute here because I have something exciting to share. I've been talking about this scripted, like, I guess you can call it miniseries that's coming next month, Seclusion. Well, I have a trailer ready to go and I'm excited to share it with you. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you've probably heard it, but for the rest of you, I hope you enjoy. As always, I want to thank each and every one of you for the support. It means the world to me and I appreciate every comment and email and review I get. And I try my hardest to answer them all personally. If you want to support the show, the best way you can do that is leave a review on your listening medium of choice. And for those who are so inclined, I do have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Haunted American History, where you can get ad-free episodes, early releases, and shoutouts. I'm doing a horror memorabilia giveaway for my patrons this month, and the item is a signed kitchen knife by A. Michael Lerner, famed stuntman who's probably most famously played Michael Myers in Halloween 6, hence the kitchen knife. It comes with a Beckett Certificate of Authenticity. It's pretty cool, and there's still time to get in on it. The patron will be picked on Tuesday, January 31st, so... So so tomorrow, yeah. Anyway, here's Seclusion. I hope you all enjoy it, and I love and appreciate all of you. What if I came up for a weekend? I'm not here to party, Betsy. Party? I mean, we haven't partied since 1965. You're sober and I'm lame. I have to write. I know, I mean, I wouldn't disturb you. I've heard that all before. All recordings and testimonies heard today are pertinent to the case of Annie Marie Singleton. Seclusion. My name is Vince LaRusso. I'm a detective with Grafton, Vermont Police Department. Seclusion. I'm Betsy, would you introduce yourself for our records? My name is Elizabeth Stewart. Seclusion. Is there anything in your conversation to suggest that your sister was in trouble? No, she sounded just as harder than I thought it would be. Seclusion. Seclusion. Nobody you can think of from your past who'd wanted to disrupt her life in some way. I don't know. The internet is crazy, so I... Betsy. Seclusion. Seclusion. Is there any... Seclusion. Seclusion. ...conceivable reason to believe... Seclusion. Seclusion. ...that Annie committed those murders? Seclusion. 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 Seclusion begins February 24th. I am dying to hear what you all think. I know you guys are going to love it. And if I'm being honest, this is a test concept. I write short stories to narrate. And I've got a killer one coming up soon. But I'm itching to write a full series. Fully casted with an original score and immersive sound. And I think I have the perfect candidate. Zach Bain. So if you enjoy seclusion, let me know. All roads lead to Zach. Okay, let's continue this trip around Arkansas. We've spent the night. Now let's ride the rails. Unlike some of the other Arkansas hauntings, the Gurdon Light is a present phenomenon and not something that has only been seen in the past. The mystery is not whether it exists or not. It's what the light is exactly. 
It's been seen on TV, photographed by tourists, and generally accepted as existing. Even Unsolved Mysteries came down to document it in 1994. The locals tell a legend to explain the light, but Unsolved Mysteries told a different one. Both legends have a common theme. The ghostly apparition is a railroad worker. The location is still used by the railways, so the way the light moves reminds you of a railway worker carrying a lantern. The story of William McLean and Lewis McBride has become an infamous part of history. While details about the altercation that led to their fatal encounter vary, it is known that it was the direct result of McBride's alleged involvement in a train derailment. Others say McBride was asking for more hours and McCain wouldn't give it to him. An article from the Southern Standard, an Arkadelphia paper, in 1932 states McBride told the sheriff that he killed McLean because McLean accused him of being the reason there was a train accident a few days prior. Either way, McLean was beaten to death with a railroad spike. McBride was sentenced to death by electrocution and executed on July 8, 1932. He appears in execution records as Louis McBride. Gurdon's light was first documented shortly after he was executed in the 1930s. It's theorized that the light is McLean, haunting the tracks and carrying the same lantern he would have carried for work. The locals have an alternative take on the occurrence, though it may not be historically accurate. According to them, a railroad worker was out of town one night and unfortunately fell in the route of an oncoming train. His head got disconnected from his body and it was never found. Residents believe that the light is actually coming from a lantern carried by him as he walks along the tracks looking for his missing head. Sadly, it wasn't unheard of for railway personnel to get hurt or die while doing their job, making it plausible that one worker suffered this decapitation. This light cannot be seen from the highway. You have to go to it. It's a two and a half mile hike to the place where you can view this mysterious lantern. Along the way, you'll pass two trestles before seeing this ghostly light. You'll know you're arrived when you crest a small incline in the tracks and there's a long hill ahead of you. The eerie and ever-changing white-blue light is often orange-tinted, if that makes sense, swaying gently in the darkness, usually best spotted on cloudy or overcast nights. Neither unsolved mysteries nor scientists have found what this light is, but there are a few theories. One leading theory that it is actually just highway lights reflecting through the trees. Historians, however, disagree. They say the light has been written about and spoken about since before the highway was ever there. Scientists have tried to explain the light and have also concluded that it can't be highway lights. In a 1980s Arkansas Gazette article, a former graduate student at Henderson State University researched the light and stated, the nearest interstate to the tracks is about four miles away, and a large hill stands in between the tracks and the interstate. If the light was caused by passing headlights, it would have to be refracted up and over the hill to be visible on the other side. The student, who was only credited as Klingen, set out to estimate how far a car would take to cross the horizon at a 45 degree angle when traveling 55 miles an hour. He calculated it to be over 80 feet per second which would mean that the lights would remain visible for much longer than an instantaneous glimpse provided by the Gurdon light. Additionally, Clinton stood close enough to the highway in order to distinguish sounds of distinct vehicles, yet they never coincided with the mysterious light's appearance. Before his passing, Dr. Charles Lemming, a professor of physics at Henderson State University, was an authority on light. His students observed the light extensively. One impressive discovery was that when the light was filtered, it never polarized. I'm not going to pretend I know what they're talking about when they talk about mirage lights polarizing and galvanometers and electronic electromagnetic current detected. Essentially, the light was there when science said it shouldn't be, is basically what they're getting through. It's a lot of scientific jargon I'm saving you from. There was another theory that I found which was more readable that suggests that Quartz crystals underneath Gurdon cause them to emit electricity, and that's what produces the light. They call this the, oh boy, piezoelectric effect, I think. The theory is that the New Madrid Fault, which runs through this area, puts intense pressure on these crystals, and it squeezes them together, which causes them to develop and discharge, which makes a spark. 
Gurdon, Arkansas is located about 75 miles south of Little Rock on Interstate 30 and is located just east of the interstate on Highway 67. The light is outside of town and along a stretch of railroad tracks. It takes a couple of hours to reach each location. You can ask for directions in Gurdon at pretty much any gas station. Everyone in the smallest town will know what you mean. They call it the Ghost Light Bluffs. It also turns out that in Crossett, Arkansas, there is a similar light with a similar story. And Crossett seems to have a lot of quartz underground too. Now, I've never made the trip to see the light for myself, but people who have have one thing in common. They all have found the light, but claim that even on the clearest of nights, no matter how vivid the light is when it's dancing in the air in front of you in the distance, the moment you get too close, it just disappears. The Gurdon ghost light is an intriguing phenomenon that has been around for generations. While this elusive light's mystery remains unsolved, it remains a fascinating part of local folklore and culture. Whether you choose to believe the stories or not, it's hard not to be intrigued by such a strange natural occurrence. Who knows? Maybe someday somebody will be able to come and shed some light on this subject. I'll see myself out. Silly name aside, the Tilly Willie Bridge, it's hard to say that without smirking, is a pretty scary place. According to legend, in the 1970s, a woman drove off Tilly Willie, a bridge in Fayetteville, Arkansas, killing herself and her children. I don't know why I had to clarify that Fayetteville was in Arkansas when this whole episode's about Arkansas, but hey, that's just what I do. The bridge was demolished in 2010, and a new one opened in 2012, but still locals claim that the ghost of a woman haunts the bridge today. In the early 1930s, Tilly Willie Bridge was built in Fayetteville. The bridge was named in the 1830s, according to legend. One of the early settlers was a woman named Matilda Wilson Ford. It is presumed Matilda's name slid off the tongue easier as Tilly Willie instead of Tildy Wilson, which is what she was known as. The property's current owner said it was added to the area to control flooding. It was never intended to be a bridge. Turns out that the Tilly Willie Bridge really should have been the Tilly Willie Dam. These really sound like curses that a toddler shouts. However, people still use the bridge, and many died while trying to cross it, including a University of Arkansas student who drowned after driving over it. The most well-known death, though, is that of a woman who killed herself and her children by driving off the bridge. Many people still claim that the woman's ghost still haunts the area. It has become a spot in Fayetteville where people visit by the carload to see if they can catch a glimpse of the Tilly Willie ghost. One such resident did just that. They had this to say about their visit. You can see a lady in white dancing off the side in a field. You can also see a green goblin looking creature crossing the creek. There are some car lights that look like they're coming at you, but there's no car. They had always been skeptical of paranormal activity, but his experience at the bridge changed his mind. As soon as we got to the bridge, it was calm, a still night. There wasn't any fog, he said, and the temperature dropped drastically, maybe like 10 degrees. They also heard knocking and a woman's voice, and that's when they decided to leave. I did snap some pictures quick, he said, but you couldn't see anything. I was just looking out at the bridge. But when we got back and developed them, there was a white orb right where we were at, right on the bridge. This wasn't the only curious person to find out if the spooky stories are real. A lot of people venture out to visit this bridge, especially during Halloween time. One woman from nearby Rogers made many trips to the Tillywilly Bridge, and she had this to say. The atmosphere was definitely very creepy and is definitely something that I won't forget, especially the first few times you go. You're just like, wow, this is just a weird place. Did someone die here? You could totally see it happening. She says that you have to see it to truly believe it. Also, that the environment around is perfect for telling scary stories. It was really creepy, she said. The trees were really overgrown and they hung over the road and it created a really creepy Halloween-like environment. She said she was very upset when they tore it down. It's completely different now, but we still have the memories, she said. 
I think the stories behind it are super cool, and you know it's neat that the legacy of the bridge is still living on even though it was torn down and redone. In spite of differing experiences, many believe that there is something or someone lurking at that bridge. The whole atmosphere and the stories behind it were scary, but it's a place I will never forget, she said. There is something. I don't know if you would call it haunted, but there is some entity there at the Tilly Willie Bridge. I am a believer, were her closing words. From the pages of the Fayetteville Observer, March 14th, 2014. Central EMS confirmed one person was killed and another person injured on Wilson Hollow Road near the Tilly Willie Bridge after a motorcycle crash. Central EMS said the motorcycle had two people aboard, a man and a woman. Fayetteville police were on the scene to determine what happened. Witnesses say that it seemed that the driver was avoiding contact with something in the road. He swerved and lost control and lost his life in the process. His passengers said there was nothing ahead of them. He swerved to avoid nothing. Arkansas is a state with rich history and many stories of hauntings. From the famous Crescent Hotel to the mysterious Tilly Willie and everything in between. I could probably do an entire season about each state and the haunts that take place there. These places have seen their fair share of ghostly activity over the years. If you're feeling brave enough to venture out into one of Arkansas's haunted sites or any of the places I've talked about or am going to talk about in the upcoming episodes, please remember that safety should always be your top priority. Be sure to bring friends along and research any potential risks before heading off on your spooky adventure. You don't want to be my next topic. I'm Christopher Feinstein. And this is Haunted American History.